When I first saw this tree back uh, in 1960, it had a big blaze and carved into the blaze was Kelly shot Lonigan 1878. Now that was all, that grew, was gradually grown over and people chopped off a few bits and eventually it was replaced with this uh, this metal bar relief. This was taken as marking the site of Stringy Bar Creek, the gun battle. And for years I accepted that, you know, this was where it had happened. But what I could never understand, as I said before, is there were no vibes here. The place did not speak to you. There was nothing, you got nothing from it. Why, when I had steeped myself in the Kelly story for so long and where I could get such amazing vibes from other places where I could feel what had happened there, I could get nothing from this place where this seminal action had taken place, where the Kelly gang had been created, where Ned Kelly had been virtually doomed by what happened here. And I couldn't place it in relation to the, um, the photos. I looked at the photos of the taken at the scene within a week of the shootings, and it just, it did not gel. I couldn't see how on earth the photos could have been taken in this landscape. Then I blamed it on gold sluicing. I knew the whole area had been sluiced heavily, and uh, that kept me happy for a while. But then I started putting it all together, and the pieces just didn't fit. There's nowhere over there where any man in, you know, with half a brain would build a hut. You know, it is very boggy, swampy country. So, 1993, uh, round about this time of the year, Darren and I started plugging up the creek to find the first place where you could build a hut and a location which would fit all the other details you can get from descriptions and from these photos. Now, we will try and repeat the act today and probably won't be able to find it. This is stringy bark. Ned Kelly said, we approached the spring as close as we could get to the clearing. Now, why did he approach the spring? He approached the spring because if they had come in a direct line from their hut at Bullock Creek, they would have come over down the hillside, straight into a little swamp, that lies immediately to the north of this rise. They would have come down a, a hillside of very, very open timber. They would have been in open view of the two police in the camp. So what they had to do was skirt around, higher up the slope, come around, down to the creek, then come up from the creek through the sword grass, across, and then from behind this fallen log, which is, it certainly isn't the one we were on then, but is in virtually the same position, spied out the police camp from that position before they bailed it up. This is the site of the, uh, the Kelly hut at Bullock Creek, where the gang uh, were digging for gold and hiding away from the police when the Stringy Bar Creek party arrived only a couple of k's away. Um, after they left, well, when they left, Ned set a light to the place and uh, tried to burn it down, but the fire was put out by rain that night. By 1884, the hut was described as ruined by uh, a surveyor, and there were, I suppose there were vestiges of it around until 1930. Certainly the site was known. Then in 1930, a uh, sawmill came along and put its log yard right on top.
just looking out over Burns Gully here. This is Burns Gully running down into the wool shed and lined up on the other side of Reedy Creek is Chapel's Gully. The burn place was just over at the edge of the trees, almost on the banks of the creek. And Joe and his family, they were always trekking up and down here um, following cattle. And this whole area was virtually a playground for young Joe and Aaron from the time they were kids, from the time they first met. Um, Aaron Sherritt's brother, Bill, had told him that Joe and Aaron had a, a corner of Burns's gully fenced for their horses. And I could, I could never work that out because, you know, Burns Gully, you'd have people going up and down looking for cattle and that. And uh, so I realised it had to be on the sides of the gully and I couldn't see where on earth you could put horses. So for years I looked around on both sides of the gully and eventually, after several years, found this place by accident. And when you look at it, it's, I mean, you've got rocks along the west side. You've got practically a cliff on the east side. It's very hard to get out on the south side. And the north side, there's a natural roadway almost leading out of it. And what I found was, what I realized, was that the fence that I'd found down in Burns Gully was a wing fence that they'd run so they could drive horses along it. And then they'd just put a fellow at the bottom and turn the horses into this bench here. Then they just throw up a, a couple of bits of sapling in a very few places and the horses were fenced in. Well, this water, this water's run in in about 10 minutes. And if you dug a trench along here, uh, and just had the trench filling up all day, you'd have plenty of water for uh, two, three horses. That's right to me. That's right to you. This uh, camping area used by the police uh, of the Burn Watch Party was it's always called the police caves, but there's really only one cave, and this is it. This is where Superintendent Hare slept while the rest of his men were just scattered round, behind, beside, under the rocks, wherever they could find a place to uh, spread their swag. When I first visited here in the early 1960s uh, with Albert Tucker, uh, there were a few bits of broken glass around, lying around the uh, floor of the cave, but uh, nothing very much, and we fossicked around a bit. And then Bert, who had a terrific archaeological sense, said, look, a bunch of young fellas, bored out of their brains, been here for weeks, when they were breaking camp, I reckon they would have chucked the bottles down the slope. So sure enough, we looked down the slope and there for a hundred feet or more were bits of broken glass and uh, some of the foil from the tops of bottles and uh, bits of rusted sardine tins, all of which I collected and lovingly preserved. When Superintendent here described the camp. He said that uh, Aaron Sherritt slept uh, in a hollow below a large boulder at the lowest point of the clearing and for years I looked around looking behind below every boulder trying to find a hollow where Aaron could have slept. And one day I was standing beside this rock and I looked below it. I couldn't see a good sleeping place. Suddenly I realised underneath it 
there was a hollow. And this is, this is what Hare could have been talking about. So, forgetting about snakes and everything, I went crawling in there, there was a bit of broken glass on the floor, and there was leaf mould all around the edges. I ran my fingers through the leaf mould, pulled out a beef tin, a bit further, a sardine tin, another beef tin, another sardine tin. Here were these tins, exactly as Aaron had just finished with them and chucked them aside uh, in 1879. It was incredible. The sardine tins had been opened with a can opener. They didn't have a key like modern ones. The beef tins had been opened with a tin opener and they had the characteristic dab of solder in the middle of the lid because they were um, just the way they used to cook the, the meat in the can, let the steam escape, then seal it. Uh, still in incredibly good condition and just a, an amazing fluke. Albert Tucker was with me that day and he took a photograph of me with the tins lined up in front of me on a rock with Pears Cave in the background. Look at slightly glazed delight on my face. Got here, up here uh, eventually. It's a uh, it's a hard place to find, and uh, we haven't been up here for a while. But uh, this is it. This is the so-called Kelly Cave. Actually, the Kellys only ever slept here one night that I'm aware of. This was a couple of nights after Stringy Bark. They were on the run after the killing of the police. Uh, they'd crossed the Oxley Flats. They came up into the ranges and fired some shots at the, outside the Sherratt homestead to attract Aaron Sherratt's attention. And he came and stood guard over them while the gang grabbed uh, probably only just one night's exhausted sleep after their flight from the Wombat Rangers. Subsequently, this, uh, this cave was used by a police party uh, who were watching the Burn homestead. It's a dramatic spot. It's, uh, it's got two levels. We're in the upper chamber. You've got another chamber below. Uh, both of them had been used by Aborigines at some stage. Uh, both of them are now visited occasionally by locals who light fires and uh, down here have just about uh, destroyed a Murray pine log that used to stick up through the roof of the cave. It's a dramatic spot. Superintendent here raved about it and said a dozen men could hold off a hundred and I think he was pretty well right, not that it ever came to that, not that the gang would ever expect it to. But the, it deserves the title, the Kelly Cave, it is a place uh, related to a unique and terrible phase in their career. It's a fantastic view but um the Kelly gang probably only looked at it once, and that's when they were camped in the cave under here, um, guarded by Aaron Sherrod after the shootings at Stringy Bar Creek. Joe and Aaron would have known it, and uh, the police certainly would have used this as a vantage point when they were camped here watching the Burn homestead. It's interesting, the Walsh's as one 19th century writer said, green and quiet as an old grave for a long time. Now the place is sort of moving in here again and I imagine it won't be terribly long before it's about as closely settled as it was in the Kelly period. It's a beautiful place to live. I just hope it remains peaceful. A patch of irises growing beside the road is a common enough sight in the Woolshed Valley, but these irises mark the site of the hut where Aaron Sherritt was killed 
by his mate Joe Byrne. Up there is the Sugarloaf Hill, just about 10 metres inside that fence was the hut where Aaron was lured to his death. Looking around at the uh, place here today, it's almost incredible to see how little remains. When I first uh, visited the site in uh, 1960, the last of the Sherrod houses was still standing. Uh, there was still a little fence around Mrs. Sherrod's garden with the uh, cherry plum trees down there. Uh, and there were still some links of chain hanging from the tree here, the old red box, where the Sherrod boys used to uh, tether their horses. Now there's, there's nothing left. All that remains of the, the house are a few rocks from the fireplace uh, but the, the lilac, this delicate sort of European tree, it's, it's surviving, living through the summers and the winters and the uh, cherry plum trees. Apart from that, just virtually nothing left. This is Glen Rowan, the tiny town where the Kelly gang's outlawry reached its explosive and fiery end. Three members of the gang died here and, of course, Ned Kelly was captured. Behind me is the, a replica of the Glen Rowan Railway Station where the police special arrived in the early hours of the 28th of June, 1880. And for the next 12 hours, an intermittent battle raged across this stretch of open bushland between the station and the Glen Rowan Inn. Ironically, in all of Glen Rowan today, the only thing that remains from the time of the Kelly siege was this railway platform. Everything else is gone. Looking around, it's, it's hard to believe what happened here, and even harder to believe that this could have become the centre of a Republican movement. The ifs are fascinating. If Kerno hadn't stopped the train, or if Ned Kelly hadn't turned back his sympathisers at the start of the siege, it could have succeeded. There could have been a Republic of Northeastern Victoria, which would have, I believe, gained terrific support. The police probably wouldn't have been able to handle it. Militias might have been called in from neighbouring towns. Eventually, it's conceivable that Imperial troops would have had to return to Australia. And you could have had something on the scale of a Boer War. A Boer War fought in the bush of the Northeastern Ranges. A frightening prospect. If those things hadn't happened. One of the most fascinating ifs of Australian history. <laughs>